We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly. And the final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 13973 in the name of Jim Hume on promoting sustainable GP recruitment. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak button now or as soon as possible and those members who are leaving the chamber again to do so quickly and quietly I now call on Jim Hume to open the debate. Mr Hume, seven minutes, please. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome fellow members, of course, back for the first members debate after the summer recess. Unfortunately, I have to bring to the attention of the Chamber, as many are aware, the many issues surrounding the state of our general practices, as uh, there, we haven't seen progress in either the numbers of GPs or their working conditions. Scottish Lib Dems uh, have taken a strong stance and have raised this issue many times. Of course, my colleague Willie Rennie conducted a sur survey earlier this summer which uncovered some truly disturbing facts about the moods of GPs and state of affairs in GP practice, uh, practices across South Scotland and the rest of our country. The issue of GP recruitment and the future of GP surgeries that are faced with a crisis is one that affects the health of nearly everyone. As general practices deliver 90% of patient care in the NHS yet receive less than 8% of the NHS funding. Naturally, this has hard-hitting consequences on GPs and the increasing demands they're facing with increasingly shrinking budgets. Their funding has been facing a near-constant reduction since 2007 from 9.2% to 7.8% in 2013. And that's, of course, further reduced by the inflation of 1.2%. Uh, that preventative amounts, which the government isn't spending, all evidence suggests that investing in GP practices can save the NHS in Scotland around £200 million. In line with its 2020 vision, the government first pledged in November £40 million for primary care in 2015-16, then said that £50 million will be spent through the primary care fund over three years. That's a reduction of £24 million per year from the amount that was originally announced. One of those elements of the scheme, the pharmacists' independent prescribers, promises to recruit 140 new pharmacists. That's 10 pharmacists per health board. I don't deny that's a welcome start, but it's the first step of a very long journey that we'll need to, make, uh, to ensure sustainability. Because when we are already seeing health boards taking over GP practices, we need to face the real numbers and see what the real issues are. If the government, government doesn't reverse its spending cuts from where spending cuts are the most hazardous, we will be facing a 2020 crisis rather than a 2020 vision. The Royal College of General Practitioners has called on the government to provide urgently a clear strategy for sustain, sustainably investing in Scottish general practices. We back that call today. We also back the call from the British Medical Association, which has raised a warning flag over recruitment. One third of GPs are cur currently considering retirement, while more than one in ten are planning to move to part-time work. That will leave a number of practices unable to operate. Yeah, of course, uh, Mr. Campbell. Rod Campbell, put your card in, please, Mr. Campbell. Um, that, will the member accept that one of the factors impacting on retirement dates for general, practice, is, uh, for general practitioners is the uh, change in the lifetime allowance for pensions? And that has been encouraging a lot of senior GPs to consider retirement, making problems worse. And uh, as far as I recall, the Lib Dems were in government when this was proposed. Mm -hmm. I, can you? I, I can assure you that the... the replies that we had from GPs focuses on far different issues ra ra rather than their pensions. Presiding officer, we need to look far into the future to see that this is a real problem 
already facing us. 463 practices have at least one GP vacancy, while some have not been able to secure locum GPs for 15 days or more within a one-month period. Practices are unable to see as many patients as need to be seen, appointments are being slashed, waiting lists for registration are getting longer, and people are being sent elsewhere uh, due to uh, reaching maximum capacity. Presenting officer, I want to stress the importance of this issue. This government uh, risks turning GP ser services from an accessible first point of contact service for every Scot into an exclusive service which many won't have access to. I want to point out how important it is for the Scottish Government to work constructively with GPs and listen to what they are saying as we are at risk of uh, losing the right to health for all Scots. My colleague Willie Rennie's survey spoke volumes. Almost four in ten GP practices find their workload unmanageable. These are the real reasons, Mr uh, Campbell. They also say that this is their greatest challenge. They state that. What is most telling, however, is that 92% of respondents want the Scottish Government's quality and outcomes framework for primary care to, re uh, to be reduced or abolished, 92%. But perhaps one of the most worrisome and discomforting facts was that one-third of GPs answered the question of whether they would choose to become GPs again with the unfortunate answer of no. Presiding officer, this raises many questions about the future of our GP services. Why is the Scottish Government not ensuring that the right amount of resources is being put where GPs think it's important? Why are we seeing less GP trainees, less retention of GPs across Scotland? Why are current GPs under so much stress and work pressures that many see their own health deteriorate? When the Scottish Government uh, enables GPs to put professionalism back to the profession, then many of these questions will surely have found their answer. If the Scottish Government wants to listen and implement some substantial solutions, there are a number of recommendations given both by the Royal College of GPs as well as the BMA. Seeing an investment in the tools that GPs have in their disposal to lead the development of new models of care would enable them and empower them to provide better services to their patients. Whether it's the newly announced investment of 500 uh, million, uh, Thousand, which I did welcome into the programme for improving outpatient services with better technology or enabling GPs to work alongside advanced nurse practitioners in their practices. It's important to recognise the leading role that GPs are playing and must continue to play in communities and urge the government to improve support and resources to ease the workloads and pressures of general practice. This includes, of course, reducing the administrative burdens. We know that GPs currently work not only more hours than they should during a typical workday, but they are also responsible for the administrative work when the practice closes up for the day. Instead of being forced to do tasks not related to medical practice, GPs, of course, should instead be enabled to spend more time with their patients, have closer working relationships with other professions, and be able to face a good interface with other experts who are involved with their patients' care. With the advent of social care and health integration, we can and should prioritise this. Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to close by ex expressing once more my concern for the future of our general practices in South Scotland and the rest of the country, and also my respect and gratitude to all our hard-working NHS staff and the hope that by listening to the facts today, the Scottish Government will decide to act to prevent this cornerstone of our health care from reaching a crisis. Thanks very much. I now call on Hans Alan Malik to be followed by Chick Brodie. Four minute speeches are thereby, please. Thank you very much and good evening, Presiding Officer. I would first of all like to thank Jim Hu for bringing the debate today here um, and because I think it's a very important debate. And I also want to thank the National Health Service for the services they currently provide in the danger of me forgetting at the end of my speech. Uh, I have to say that uh, the, the general practitioners uh, um, survey is a linchpin, linchpin of the National Health Service. Therefore, when the British Medical Association stated that the shortfall on our uh, general practitioners would impinge on patient care back in March, uh, I'm surprised that the government didn't respond to that earlier. I think it's important to try and encapsulate the actual difficulties uh, not only our GPs are facing, but the public are facing. Uh, my, my colleagues have highlighted um, a number of issues 
uh, facing uh, our doctors today, uh, the fact that um, vacancies are not being filled. I know uh, of a practice in Glasgow where they're looking for somebody to uh, fill a, a vacancy and they failed to do so up until now. And the fact that the morale is very low amongst our doctors, I think is quite shocking because we depend upon them to boost our morale. We depend on our doctors to, to be there for us, to ensure that we are not suffering from um, all sorts of ailments. And if they themselves are feeling under pressure, if they're feeling that they, they have inadequate uh, resources at their, at their hands to, to treat their patients, then that sends a very, I think, a very poor signal to our citizens. Inequalities in Glasgow are probably the greatest. Um, we talk about um, services to communities which are um, sparsely populated, long journeys to, to travel. People have, either patients have to travel long distances or the doctors have to travel the distances and then not to be able to get the service that they are hoping to get at the end of that journey uh, is, is pretty detrimental, I, I would have thought, for, for, for any community. But also in uh, densely populated areas such as Glasgow, uh, I see more and more people now who are complaining about either not being able to get appointments or when they get appointments, they feel that they're rushed in and out of surgeries because of pressures on doctors' time. And I think sometimes what is really important is that not only do we need to ensure that the doctors feel that they're valued, that they have the resources at their fingertips, but also the patients when they go and see the doctors feel that they're being listened to and they're getting a good proper hearing. No, no patient feels comfortable if they go in, doctor says, right, what's wrong with you? Start struggling, here's your medication out the door. That's not what a lot of people think they're going to see the doctor for. Sometimes just good advice is very valuable for them and sometimes they don't actually need medication. But it depends on what the doctor has at their resource. A lot of the things which are now happening, for example, when doctors say that they would rather not be in, in this job or in this career if they had another opportunity, I remember people used to want to give the right arm to become a doctor. This was a, this was a profession that people actually tried very hard to get into because if they wanted to serve the communities, they wanted to make a difference uh, in where they lived. And if that's not happening, then it's a bad day. Therefore, a proper policy developed which looks at all these various issues that the pressure that are now being put upon um, needs to be done. The Scottish Government really needs to take up this gauntlet, and really needs to take up this challenge, and has to work with the doctors more closely than they have done so far. Talking to doctors is not a bad idea. Let's please do that, and let's hope that we can improve upon the service and the pressures that the people have uh, can stop. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Chick Brody to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I firstly thank Jim Hume for uh, bringing this debate forward this, uh, this evening. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, as always, general practice is central to the future of the National Health Service in Scotland. It is, of course, the front line for many people. Yet the recent BMA Scotland Conference for Scottish Local Medical Committees discussed the issue that many uh, GPs are struggling not, uh, general practices are struggling not just to rec recruit uh, doctors, but also to get locum cover. General practice is or can also be a very cost effective part of the Scottish healthcare system. Recent calculations by the Royal College of General Practitioners has shown that even investing another £72 million in GP consult consultations in the UK would lead to a saving of £375 million rising to £708 million by the end of 2019, which it translates into a possible saving of £70 million in, in Scotland. And this is done by uh, looking at a creative way of freeing up uh, time uh, for general practitioners. Uh, the Scottish Government recognised this when it announced in June this year uh, increased funding into primary care of a sum of £50 million over three years. This increased investment provides an initial impetus to encourage GPs to try new ways of working over the next three years, helping to address the problems of recruitment and retention that are common, so common to primary care services. Alan McDevitt, the chair of the BMA's Scottish GP Committee, also raised 
another important opportunity in increasing primary care funding, and that is the evolving health and social care integration plan. Mr McDevitt states that, quote, investment in leadership training will provide GPs with additional skills to influence the design and delivery uh, of efficient community services for their patients. He further went on to state that the recruitment of additional pharmacists working with GPs will provide much needed support. Uh, and I would hope that in the long term, this investment uh, could be extended so that every practice in Scotland would be able to have a practice-based uh, pharmacist. Both practice-based and community pharmacists are uniquely placed to work with GPs to improve patient care and safety and can play an important role in the long-term management of patients with chronic diseases. And I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary for Health suggesting that we should have triage nurses in pharmacies uh, in this world of instant society so that uh, lesser illnesses could be uh, treated in the pharmacies and freeing up uh, time for uh, uh, GPs. In March this year, the RCGP and the Royal Pharmaceutical Society issued a joint statement uh, on GP practices. Based pharmacists, this, this highlighted the important role that practice-based pharmacists can have uh, based in creating efficient uh, general practice services. There should be investment in recruitment and, and training of pharmacists based in general practice who would be of considerable value in reviewing patients' medication, managing polypharmacy, managing medication issues for the housebound within the newly uh, integrated healthcare system, linking effectively with community pharmacists and medicines reconciliation across the interface, all with significant ben benefit to patients' health and safety. This could improve care, save the NHS a significant amount of money and alleviate pre pressure on GPs, thereby creating a free time investment opportunity. The RCGP and RPS also work together on how community pharmacists and GPs can work together to improve in patient, uh, patient care. They set out recommendations for benefits to patients in improving liaison between community pharmacists and GPs. Finally, there are already a number of initiatives across Scotland which promote collaborative working with community pharmacists. And the Highland Community Pharmacy being one, Healthcare Improvement Scotland also has the National Patient Safety Programme. Presiding officer, much is being done to improve GP recruitment and retention, which I commend. But let us look at much wider vehicles to provide a, a more extensive landscape as to how we can create the retention and recruitment of GPs. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Alex uh, Presiding officer, as the uh, motion states, 90% of uh, patient interactions with the health service uh, are with primary care services. And since the whole direction of health policy for over a decade has been towards more services being delivered in community settings, that percentage can only be set to increase. And that's really the background to uh, the very serious concerns that I'm sure everybody has about the current situation. I found this in my own constituency. Recently, the most uh, stark example being the Leith Links Medical Practice, where uh, three GPs left and they could not replace uh, one of them. And the result of that was uh, 2,000 patients being told they had to leave that practice and being sent somewhere else and the health board uh, taking over the running of the practice. And of course, that's not uh, unique in Edinburgh in terms of the health board's uh, intervention. So uh, more nationally, of course, we know some of the alarming uh, figures. I suppose part of the background is the percentage of the budget on uh, GPs uh, uh, or, uh, uh, being 9.8%, for example, 10 years ago, and the latest figure we have, or the 2012-13 figure anyway, being 7.8%. So that in itself is grounds for serious concern. The overall number, uh, whole-time equivalent GPs, is flattening, and the applications for the GP uh, training posts uh, last year fell by 10%. So clearly, something must be done, and I'm sure the government accepts that as well. Now, probably we need a whole range of measures, perhaps, uh, for example, just to pick out one incentives for graduates to enter uh, GP training. But I think that the big issue that has to be addressed is workload. And Jim Hume referred to uh, his survey, which overwhelmingly uh, put workload as the number one issue. And of course, that is partly related to the overall number of GPs. That's fairly obvious, but it's also related to what 
GPs do and who they work with. Now, in some ways, people, some people may be surprised that workload is such an issue because, of course, after the, the contract, the, uh, the new contract was introduced, which, which I was involved with at the time when I was health minister, uh, some people were saying, oh, they've got it easy now. They're not having to do all that out of hours. That was the kind of mood music among a lot of people in the public. But I think we have to understand as the years have passed several things, but including demographic change, more people in the population simply, including more older people with complex medical conditions that have to be looked after by GPs and primary care more generally, and also that shift towards primary care, which hasn't happened as much as we wanted, but has still been happening. So, uh, to some extent, the government has addressed this issue in the programme for government in general terms. Uh, they talked about developing clusters, and that's a good thing, so that the skills and expertise uh, of GPs are shared across uh, the uh, uh, practices. But also, of course, we need to embed general practice in the wider primary health care team and uh, expand the wider primary care workforce, including uh, practice-based uh, pharmacists. Instead of the clusters, uh, I, I should also have made the point, which in a way is fairly obvious, that that needs to be aligned with the locality integration arrangements. And there's a good opportunity, of course, to do that. Now, of course, the QOF is much talked about as well. Some GPs, I note, uh, want to abolish it. Others want to dis, uh, disassociate it from practice income. I have to say, uh, when, the, when the GP contract uh, came in, and I was getting a bit of stick for these uh, new contracts in those days, the consultant's contract and the GP contract, I actually was quite pleased that uh, some of the extra money for GPs was related to... Uh, doing specific things via the QOF. And, and, and I notice even GPs who are critical of it have said that it did uh, transform the management of care, certainly for some practices uh, who were perhaps lagging behind the best practices. No doubt the best practices, such as Dr. Simpson say, were doing many of these things uh, anyway. So my own view would be that we need to keep the good bits of the QOF and still relate it to practice income, but clearly not all GPs agree with that. Final last point, infrastructure is clearly very important and one particular problem, a concern in my cons uh, constituency, is the development of the North West Partnership Centre, just on the edge of my uh, constituency, uh, which will have a, 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 a new GP practice as well as many other services. And that, of course, has been delayed because of the changes to the funding arrangements for the hub programme. And uh, I know that's not uh, totally within the control of the Scottish Government, but if, if, if the Minister can't say something about that, I really would expect the Cabinet Secretary to be making a statement about that to Parliament in the very near future. Thanks so much. I now call on Alex Ferguson to be followed by Dr. Lane Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I, like others, congratulate Jim Hume on securing this debate? It is a motion that should, and I think obviously does, concern each and every one of us. And I would like to think that it is an issue that can be addressed by a genuinely cross party approach, uh, as my party has been advocating over the last few years. The statistics that surround this subject really do speak for themselves. If Scotland's predicted growth up to 2020 reaches its maximum, we will require 915 more GPs. If it reaches just its minimum, we will still require a further 560 plus. So let's take the average and assume, as the motion itself does, that we will require somewhere around 740, 50 more GPs by 2020. That is quite a challenge, especially when you take into consideration that fewer medical students are opting to go into general practice every year, that two-thirds of all GPs could retire within the next five years, and that 20% of GP training positions were not even taken up this year. If this isn't yet the crisis that the BMA claims, then it is certainly a major problem that demands urgent attention. And I would suggest the first thing that needs to uh, be done is that much more needs to be done to take action to improve recruitment and retention of GPs. Too many currently go abroad because of improved salaries and conditions, and they don't return. Too many GPs, 92% in the survey that's been spoken about, believe that consultation times are inadequate. 69% said their workload has a negative impact on the care received by their patients. So surely we need to review urgently aspects such as the box-ticking activities that GPs have to undertake that could just as easily be undertaken by nurse practitioners and others, especially as patients who need more specialist care are increasingly transferred from hospitals to their local communities. 
It seems to me that the current structure of primary care is not geared up to deal with the current policy of more and more people spending their latter years in their homes rather than in a hospital. And that particularly impacts on a rural constituency such as my own of Galloway and West Dumfries. Across the local health board region of Dumfries and Galloway, there are currently around 12 GP vacancies out of a required establishment of 130. That's near enough 10%. And some of those vacancies are proving extraordinarily difficult to fill. And the further west you go, or if I could put it another way, the more remote you become, uh, the harder it becomes to fill those vacancies. Recruitment becomes harder, retention becomes harder, and the pro issue itself therefore becomes harder to solve. And on top of that, the risks to both in hours and out of hours services also increase and become very substantial under these circumstances. To the board's credit, advanced nurse practitioners are being appointed to try to plug some of the gaps. But the board accepts that if it is to manage age-related and chronic conditions outside acute hospital settings, a comprehensive primary care GP coverage is absolutely essential. And if that coverage continues to decline at the current rate, the default position will simply be higher hospital admissions with the real possibility that there simply won't be enough hospital beds. And simultaneously, the planned integration with social care services will not be able to achieve its full potential without the required GP workforce. Now, it doesn't paint a very pretty picture, presiding officer. So what we must have, I think, is a clear strategic direction to try to reverse the decline in recruitment and, in, um, and retention. And on that note, I was really interested in the First Minister's announcement this afternoon that 10 pilot schemes of new models of primary care are to be introduced across Scotland. I would strongly recommend and suggest that one of them is located in the west of my constituency, where, if nothing else, it would be extremely well tested. I hope that initiative works, presiding officer, because if it doesn't, then the crisis that the BMA is talking about will have become a very serious reality. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Dr. Elaine Murray to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. And can I start by thanking and congratulating Jim on bringing this issue to the chamber? Because, as Alex Ferguson has said, uh, a lack of GPs is a significant issue in Dumfries and Galloway, albeit a more significant issue in his constituency than in mine, but sufficiently problematic to have been referenced in the BMA briefing, specifically about Dumfries and Galloway uh, in their briefing now. Um, one of the reasons we have been told by the Chief Executive of NHS to Friesen Galloway is that more graduates are interested in specialisms. It is, specialist medicine is more attractive than general practice for a whole uh, host of reasons, uh, and it is difficult to get people to go into a general practice. Um, the shortage of professionals is not confined to GPs. In Dumfries and Galloway, we know that there are a shortage, for example, in recruiting teachers, and there are shortages in recruiting social workers. Some of those shortages uh, in professions are around the opportunities for the partners of professionals. I think that is an issue where there's a, maybe a shortage of professional jobs. Uh, but within other professions, uh, there have been initiatives to try and grow more of those professionals. So, for example, Dumfries and Galloway Council uh, paid for the training of social workers with uh, the University of Glasgow, and we've recently had an initiative called Grow Your Own Teacher in Dumfries and Galloway, where people are being encouraged to come out of other professions within education and train as teachers. That's not as easy to do with GPs, that you can't really grow your own GP, uh, particularly in an area where, where there's not teaching hospitals and there's not actually a, a me medical uh, courses on, uh, on offer at the universities. And we see things, for example, like attempts to recruit from other countries. That always makes me slightly anxious, though, because we're recruiting from countries where those GPs are needed in their own country. We're actually taking often from countries which are worse off medically than we are. I have to say I too am concerned about recently trained GPs going off abroad, maybe into private practice, and I wonder whether there's some ways in which we can dissuade people who have been trained by the taxpayer here in Scotland or in the UK from taking those skills that they've recently acquired and taking them into private practice perhaps abroad. But, and this is, my, this is an idea which comes from me. It's not Labour Party policy, so I'm not, I hope nobody's going to take it as that. But I do wonder whether there is a, a possibility of training other suitably qualified professionals to bring them into medicine. Now, my daughter has degrees in psychology and she's training as a mental health nurse. Uh, 
I know a number of young people with degrees in history or in chemistry even who train uh, to become lawyers after they've graduated. And I wonder if there's a possibility, for example, of well-qualified scientists managing to be retrained into medicine, maybe with a, an indication that they go into general practice. Now, um, we, I'm, I'm not suggesting, for example, that lots of scientists leave science because we know there's actually a shortage of scientists as well. But people with that sort of training might be able to be retrained. We know that actually there is a loss of people from science. There's a loss particularly of women from science, whether there's a possibility there. Now, um, I did actually run the possibility of retraining other people past the chief executive of the NHS in Dumfries and Galloway, and he was a, a bit concerned about it. He felt that people who weren't adequately trained uh, in medicine could be risk-averse and could then just refer everybody on to consultants and, and create workload problems elsewhere. But I do think, with particularly in the sciences, that people who are trained to high level in science do have an expertise of assessing uh, the evidence uh, and making sort of uh, evidence-based decisions. So I'll just lay that on the table. I probably completely horrify the entire med medical es establishment in Scotland uh, by making this suggestion, but I just wonder whether that's something which could be examined as to whether or not other professionals might be able to be trained. It would be shorter, it would be quicker and less expensive than training people from scratch and whether that might be a possible, uh, one of a number of possible solutions. Thanks. Many thanks. Many thanks. And I now call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And having spoken a little bit about um, the issue around primary care uh, in my contribution during the programme for government debate and indeed uh, speaking about it during a health debate that we held prior to the summer recess, uh, I thank Jim Hume for, for bringing the issue back to the Chamber. I'm interested by the comments around workload and one of the things that, that I've spoken about uh, in the Chamber in the past and, and Malcolm Chisholm alluded to it, is how we can perhaps uh, better align primary care services to perhaps reduce GP workload by having people being appropriately triaged uh, to other services where that is the more appropriate place for their conditions uh, to be dealt with. And uh, some GP practices, I know uh, from my own constituency, are doing that. They're speaking to people at the point they request an appointment and are redirecting them to, uh, for example, pharmacy, if that is the more appropriate place for them to be seen. Some GP services, I don't think, do that yet. And that may, may be a contributing factor to some of the workload issue. Certainly, a, a percentage of the workload may be uh, able to be redirected elsewhere and dealt with in a different environment. Uh, I think the, the issue around uh, how we utilise other primary care uh, professionals I think is something that does need to be uh, examined and I'm confident that through the work that the Scottish Government is undertaking uh, to look at redesigning uh, how primary care is delivered that will happen uh, and there are good, pra good practice examples out there. The Minister uh, will be very familiar with the Middlefield Healthy House in Aberdeen and an example I think of, of good practice and good use of uh, nurse practitioner services which could could perhaps be remodelled uh, in other areas depending uh, on circumstances. I think, I, I think the, the point that my colleague Rod Campbell raised in his intervention around pensions is actually uh, relevant to this and the conversations I've been having locally with GPs, particularly those GPs in their mid to late 50s, suggest that that is a decision that they are now facing as to whether they uh, continue to work in general practice and take the pension hit that will follow as a result or retire early in order to benefit from their pension as a result of the changes that have been brought in by the UK government. And that is not uh, a, a decision that one would, would want those GPs to have to be facing, but there is a financial element to the decisions that they now face uh, in terms of retirement. We also have to think, I think, look at the fact that the, 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 the makeup of the GP workforce has changed uh, over time. It used to be a predominantly male full-time workforce. It is now uh, a predominantly female part-time workforce. And there are a number of reasons behind that, which uh, probably don't have time to go into in detail. But one, I, and I, I acknowledge that you shake your head at that point, presiding officer, don't worry, I wasn't going to go into the detail. But one of the things I think that does need to be looked at is how uh, GP services are structured to, uh, to deal with uh, that change in the workforce, but also uh, how we attract graduates in. And that's a point that's been raised on a couple of sides of the chamber. And some of the discussion that I've had with medical students and medical student representatives has been the uh, question of partnership. 
has been a, a decisive factor for many uh, in, in, in making their decision. I agree with the, the point that, that Dr Murray makes about uh, it being also about specialisms being perhaps more attractive, but also I think the, the view that there may be an income, a, a requirement to take on the role of partnership and not feeling that that's something that graduates would want to do. That's why I think looking at a confederated model where perhaps practices control a number of premises rather than one individual premise. So you could have perhaps a smaller cohort of partners, but operating a number of practices where you could then employ those GPs is something that needs to be examined and I know is being examined certainly by the health board in Grampian. So I think there are a number of things that can be done. I think the, the, the uh, programme for government makes some encouraging signs towards those reforms that are taking place. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that that will help in addressing some of the issues that we do face in our general practices um, at the moment. Thanks so much. And I call on Dr Richard Simpson, after which we move to closing speech from the Minister. Thank you. I'm very glad that we're actually now debating general practice, and I welcome Jim Hume's uh, motion and the um, survey which he did, and he knows I did a survey as well this summer, as did the BBC. So there's been a lot of work done on actually trying to collect the data. So the first point I'd like to make is, why on earth didn't we have this data very clearly available before? You know, this, this, this uh, crisis, which it is, it's a growing crisis, has not just emerged out of nowhere. I warned in 2010 that we should actually be considering a separate GP contract because the NHS in Scotland is now so radically different from England, and yet we still have a UK contract. Now, I'm glad that we're now going to have a, 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 a separate contract in Scotland. Now, let's look at the factors. I'm not going to talk about the solutions. I'm publishing a document tomorrow. I'll be publishing a document tomorrow with a comprehensive list. Uh, it's not actually comprehensive, but it's a consultation document of all the suggestions which I've received over the summer. I received 400 replies uh, from doctors representing 330 practices. Actually, when the survey closed, there was another 49 practices responded. Now, the factors that are around are very clear. First of all, there's been an increase in the population, roughly 170,000 since the SNP came to power. If it's one for 1,500, that means we needed about another 120 GPs just to provide a standstill situation in terms of population. But it's worse than that because the number, the demographic uh, uh, character of that population has also changed. There has been a 17% increase in the number of over 75s, and it's the over 75s who have more complex conditions. So that means GPs have to spend more time with them. Why? Because the hospital services operate on a silo basis. They treat single, single disease entities, not humans in holistic form. That's what general practices are good about. That's what GPs are excellent at. They're good at diagnosis, they're good at managing complex morbidity, but they do not have the time to do that. And the reason is because the COAF, which was useful initially, it was a good part of the new contract. The first time general practice was paid for quality, the COAF became an increasingly bureaucratic exercise. Two years ago, the document on COAF ran to 226 pages. Even last year with the cuts, it was 186 year, uh, this year, 186 pages. Now, the other thing that's happened, apart from the increase in morbidity, increase in population, increase in the number of seven, over 75s, has been a shift in the balance of care, something we've all wanted. But that has been completely and almost totally unresourced. So these are the factors in the background. And what is the result? The result is today trainee vacancies, 20% as we stand here today this year, 20% trainee vacancies, predominantly in the west of Scotland. Emigration is up. In my own practice, Bridge of Allen, and the neighbouring practice of Dunblane, two of the nicest spots you could want to practice in, they have lost one doctor each in the last 18 months to Australia. These are doctors in their 30s, and when I contacted them and asked them about it, they said, there's no way we're coming back. One of them said he was going to just try it, but he phoned up and said, no, I'm definitely not coming back. Now, this pro as I say, this has been something which has been going on for some time. Malcolm Chisholm mentioned the reduction in, in the funding, proportion of funding from 9.8 to 7.8 percent. So it's not coincidental that with the share of funding going down to general practice and the resources that they need to having to go up, that there is a crisis. Now in 2011, this party said we should have a national conversation. We called it the Beveridge Commission for 21st century. 
This government ignored that request, and indeed so did the Conservatives. But what the Welsh Government did was to establish the Bevan Commission. And in 2013, they introduced clusters. That's only now in the Government statement today that they're going to have clusters. The result of introducing clusters and a raft of other measures, which in fact I was discussing with the people in Wales, has resulted in the per capita population, GPs per population, rising in, in Wales in the last 18 months, whereas it's continued to sink in Scotland. So I'm glad the crisis has now been recognised. The debate on BBC that I had with, uh, indirectly with Maureen Watt earlier this summer, we were told, oh, there are more GPs in Scotland than ever. That's been the mantra for three years. And yet, actually, the numbers of full-time equivalents has only gone up by 35 since 2008. So I'm glad the crisis is recognised. I'm glad that some funding is being applied. That funding, in my view, is wholly inadequate. Wish to draw to and we will need to do very much more. And I will have my proposals will be published tomorrow. Uh, and we are discussing that with general practitioners. Thanks so much. Now, call on the Minister, Maureen Watt, to close the debate on behalf of the Government. Seven minutes are thereby, please, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And we've heard much this evening about the difficulties which part of general practice finds themselves in, and I will address these issues shortly. However, firstly, I want to make it clear that this Government attaches the highest value to Scotland's GPs and the work they do. Scotland's population is increasing, as we've heard, we're living longer with multiple and often complex conditions, which will become increasingly the norm over the next years. I have every confidence that Scotland's general practice can deliver what is needed to meet the challenge of demographic change, but also recognise that some significant changes need to be made to relieve the work pressures and to help with recruitment and retention. And we're working with GPs and have started to make those changes. Earlier today in this chamber, the First Minister set out the programme for government and highlighted the early success of the integration and of health and social care. And this will ensure as much care as possible is provided in community settings. The First Minister also outlined the importance of testing new models of care, building on, in, on innovation that is already being developed locally and integrating different types of care. We want to ensure that local community-based services are delivered by the appropriate range of health and social care professionals working together more effectively. And this comes with a commitment to invest. In Scotland, we spend a record 12 billion each year on our health service, of which some 770 million is invested in general practice. We will be investing a recently announced 60 million primary care fund to transform primary care, building on great examples across, across the country of providing care for patients at or near home rather than in hospital. This funding will help to address immediate workload and recruitment issues through long-term sustainable change. Specifically, this fund will increase the number of medical students choosing to train as GPs and encourage those wanting to work in rural or deprived areas. We will continue the Enhanced Returners Programme, supporting GPs who wish to return to the profession and develop a programme for local GP leadership and networking. Zala Malik. Thank you very much for taking the intervention. And I welcome the comments you've made today, right now. One of the things you've touched upon is uh, students wanting to go on to become general practitioners. I was wondering whether there's a possibility of working with the education institutions to see if we could actually increase places as well for, for, for general practitioners to try and relieve the pressure, the, the short pressure that we're facing in the, in the real near future. Thank you. Maureen Watt. Well, Hans Alamik Malik makes an important point. I mean, for every one place of student place that we have, there are 11 people wanting that place, 11 young people wanting that place. So we have people wanting to go in to the medical field, but we need to be sure that we're getting the right people uh, in as students, the ones who want to live and work in their own communities and to be uh, GPs. And that's what um, we are working with the BME and others on. And we're consulting with others to increase the output from medical schools, encouraging and improving training in general practice. So by the end of 2015-16, we will already have invested in an additional 10 million in enhancing primary care. And this will be further supported by total investment of 50 million over the following two years. 
But there are challenges. This government knows that GP workload is increasing, as is the complexity of health care. And where more is being delivered outside hospital uh, settings, resources haven't always followed. We understand that GP services in some places are stretched and that at the same time communities rightly expect more of their health services. So our plan is to transform our approach to primary care to ensure that in the future people see the right professionals more quickly. That's why we'll continue to work with Scotland's GPs to design that new future. And that's why a review of primary care out of our service was commissioned. And that's why we need to redesign primary care in a collaborative and inclusive way, transforming and invigorating the workforce, creating new roles and supporting communities to innovate so that services are available where people need them. Scotland's GPs have a vision for the future of general practice and it's a compelling vision which this government shares. This is a future where care is provided by multidisciplinary professional teams planned and delivered within the localities that need them. This is a future where GPs are the expert medical generalists, the doctors making the critical clinical decisions about their patients, but not necessarily being the first point of contact. We've been working with the Scottish General Practitioner, Practitioners Committee to redesign the contract and we'll have the first version in place by 2017. That is a timescale GP union leaders tell us is realistic and negotiations on the detail will take place in 2016. And um, as others have mentioned, we have a separate agreement in Scotland and English GPs are very envious of this. So by 2017, we will have made significant progress to change the way general practitioners work. We will remove the annual churn of contractual changes and introduce the, introduce the next version of the GP contract three years later in 2020, when this transformation in the way GPs work will be near complete. Our approach will build on innovations already underway that reflect local priorities. For example, in reducing health inequalities in Craig Miller and Govan, improving mental health in Fife, and helping people to age well in Tayside. Equipped with this flexibility, care will develop in ways that match the needs of different individuals and communities in cities, towns, villages, and rural areas. The integration of different types of care is already the practice at Clackmannanshire Community Health Care Centre. It provides primary care through three GP practices while also providing wider services such as outpatient services to inpatient wards, a day therapy unit and local men mental health resource centre. The centre is also a base for district nurses, health visitors, community rehabilitation, rehabilitation teams, health improvement and a wide range of support services and classes. We know that one size doesn't fit all. That is why we wish to test and seek views of new models of care, including those which might be delivered by multidisciplinary teams in a community hub type arrangement, whether that's physical hubs or virtual hubs, but where professionals collaborate across the boundaries of primary and secondary care. And all of this, of course, focused on high quality care and improved health outcomes which will provide more connected, streamlined working within healthcare and across health and social care and voluntary support services. Professionals being able to support patients facing wider social issues which are having an impact on their health and well-being. And clearer signposting, information and support so people know where to go for the most appropriate treatment or follow-on service. Presiding officer, the time has come to start talking up Scotland's general practice, to encourage more doctors to stay within the profession and to ensure medical students choose a career in general practice because it's one which deserves to be admired and respected. It's time to create some excitement for the future of general practice in Scotland and I know on social media that's already the case with some of our young students. And for now, this government will continue to work with Scotland's general practitioners to deliver a model of sustainable general practice that is right both for the profession and, more importantly, for the health of the people of Scotland. Many thanks. And that concludes this important debate. I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you very much.